and welcome to the National World War II Museum's podcast series, Service on Celluloid. This podcast is brought to you through the generous support of the Albert and Ethel Hertzstein Charitable Foundation. Each week, our in-house experts sit down with special guests to discuss depictions of World War II on film. Sit back and get ready for a lively debate that will reveal the good and bad of how Hollywood shows the 20th century's most dramatic event. My name is Seth Perrin, historian and digital content manager here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans, and our special guests for today's episode are three of my buddies and frequent guests on this program, Mike Scott, movie critic. Hello, Seth. Josh Schick, curator here at the museum. Hey, Seth. And last but certainly not least, Larry DeCure is curator at the museum. Hello, everyone. Today, we will be discussing the 2001 epic motion picture, Pearl Harbor. The film centers on three main characters— two best friends named Rafe and Danny, and a Navy nurse named Evelyn. Rafe is a near illiterate who somehow is able to overcome his lack of education and muscle his way through strict pre-war Army physical and educational restrictions to become one of the baddest fighter pilots on the Army Air Corps. And it was the Army Air Corps at this time. Danny is somewhat smarter but much more naive version of the first who is a hanger-on to Rafe and heaps hero worship on his best friend and idolizes him, so much so that he steals his girlfriend, who happens to be a Navy nurse, with no real meaningful lines to utter throughout the entirety of the film. Oh yeah, I forgot the movie is set in the period shortly before the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor and spirals through both the attack on the U.S. Pacific Fleet and the Doolittle Raid. So, Pearl Harbor stars Ben Affleck as Rafe McCauley, Josh Hartnett as Danny Walker, Kate Beckinsale as Evelyn Johnson, Jennifer Garner, Michael Shannon, Dan Aykroyd, Cuba Gooding Jr., John Voight, Alec Baldwin, and Tom Sizemore and his shotgun. The movie was directed by Michael Bay and produced by Bay and Jerry Bruckheimer. Surprisingly, the movie was nominated for four Academy Awards, winning one for Best Sound Editing. Even more surprising, it was a financial success, but less surprising, a critical disaster. So, gentlemen, shall we? How accurate is Pearl Harbor? Josh? Yeah, that's a... (laughs) It's gonna be a no for me, dog. That's a... Not even close on the accuracy. I guess that people were alive in the 1940s. It's about the thing that they hit. Larry, what about you? I watch this movie every time. It's on TV. I love it. <laughs> I'm no, no. It's it's a bad movie, man. It's just bad all the way around. I can't say anything good about it, and I I don't like Michael Bay films to begin with. So I mean, that's. It's like three strikes already. Sorry. This should be fun, Mike. What about you? <laughs> You know, the first podcast I think I did with you guys, I, th- I believe it was the first one we talked about Torah, Torah, Torah. Yep, it was. And Pearl Harbor was, of course, brought up because right. Torah, 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 Torah also being about the Pearl Harbor attack. And Seth, your face just turned like beet red. And from that moment, and you know, we've mentioned it a couple other times in a couple of subsequent podcasts, yep. but from that moment, I've been looking forward to this day. <laughs> 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 we could talk. I think in that first podcast, you declared it. it and I quote, garbage. It is and garbage. So today, what I, I'm, I'm hoping to see how long it takes before like a vein on his forehead ruptures. So I hope you guys got your splatter guards on because this is, this is going to be messier than a Gallagher uh, show, I have a feeling. I think we've been leery of even broaching the subject with a microphone <laughs> within earshot, let alone 20 feet oh, when it comes good. to talking about this bad boy. We're good. We're good. So one of the... Uh, one of the things in this movie is there There are a ton, a ton of characters. Uh, there's a lot of fictional characters, uh, we just know, you know, the entire cast, and then there's a lot of actual historical characters, too, or characters based on real people. Uh, Jimmy Doolittle, Dory Miller, FDR, uh, Admiral Yamamoto, to name just a few. How well does the film capture these stories, in your opinion, Mike? Not well. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look, look, I think one of the things that this movie does is it, it does try to add uh, a, a, some personal story to it. Because when we talked about Tor Tor Tor, that was part of the problem with that movie, I thought, was there really wasn't a whole lot of, y- y- it was a little clinical. And so they try to add some personal stories to it. And uh, and they do that. Um, they don't really do it well. The, the, uh, w- one of the things I forgot about this movie when... As looking forward to doing this podcast, of course, I had to rewatch it. Just how insufferable it is, really, for the for the first half of it, which is all personal story. It's all backstory. That's where we're we're meeting Danny and Rafe, and and uh, I forget what the the Evelyn Evelyn. That's right. Um, so th- th- there, it does add some personal. I don't want to use the word depth, but it does add some personal <laughs> uh, personal element to it. I'm not sure if it works real well. In fact, I know it doesn't work real well, but you know. 
Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I guess I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, three, three of the guys that, that are portrayed in here that are very well known in World War II history, obviously one of them would be President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Um, there's a lot of him in there played by John Voight. And, With a bad chin prosthetic. Yeah, he doesn't look good no. at all. He's got a lot of really bad makeup on, too. Looks like he get punched in both eyes. <laughs> He's got some purple underneath those eyes. Need some vitamin C or allergy medicine. But anyway, um, you know, there's a there's a particular scene, and uh, Josh, we've discussed this before. It's after the attack on Pearl Harbor, yet before the attack on Japan itself, for which, you know, of course, a Doolittle raid. And uh, he does something extraordinary, which, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt never actually did. He comes out of his wheelchair, and by 1942, he was, you know, the real FDR was stricken with polio. I mean, he was, he'd had polio since, well, for a long time. I don't know exactly when, but a long time. And he was incapable of doing that kind of thing. But it, why do you, does anybody have any utter clue as to why that would have even occurred in this film? I, I think the deal with all that stuff is, is kind of my deal with their historic figures. I think they had a list, of people they wanted to include. They checked the box by putting them in the movie, and then they murdered every single one of those historic figures with cheesy lines or kind of like tacky symbolic gestures. And I think that that's what that whole standing up thing is. America's been hit and we're going to stand back up and it's you've just like killed everything that's amazing about FDR with this one. And well, and this is what Michael Bay movement. does, right? That, you know, he's best known for the Transformers movies, but he is the poster boy for brainless blockbusters. <laughs> and I think... That, that, that term fits this movie to a T. It is an absolutely brainless blockbuster. Uh, it, it wanted to be, you know, something that lived longer than it did, but it did. It made money. It made quite a bit of money, actually. They should have called it Pearlmageddon. <laughs> Ooh, I yeah. like it. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, one of the other characters that's uh, accurate, <laughs> who, am I, who am I kidding, inaccurately played here is Dory Miller. Mm-hmm. And he's somebody that's known very, very well. You know, again, if you know anything about World War II or anything about Pearl Harbor at all, you've heard of Dory Miller. Dory Miller, of course, was the African-American mess attendant on the West Virginia who uh, is credited with shooting down a couple of Japanese airplanes during the attack. And that is portrayed, I don't want to say well, in this movie. But, I mean, you get the idea of what Dory Miller did when you watch this movie. But it's also very, as you just said, you know, brainless Michael Bay blockbuster esque. You know, when Cuba Gooding Jr. is standing behind the twin fifties, I believe, which weren't on American battleships at all, and he's just screaming and hollering as he's shooting down the Japanese planes, yeah. and very much like, you know, that's the only way to shoot accurately, Seth. Oh yeah, you have to holler. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah you got to holler. It's like <laughs> tennis. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the only thing I can say about Cuba Gooding Jr. So been, he, he's a cool, he's a cool dude. He was not the right guy to play Dory Miller. You ever seen the physical stature of Dory Miller? He was huge. He was six three and like two hundred and thirty pounds. He, Cameron Jordan, defensive end for the Saints, would have been a better choice to play Dory Miller. That being said, as somebody, I, I didn't know what Dory Miller looked like in real life. He's and, a huge man, and, but, big guy. But not knowing that, I thought that Cuba brought uh, uh, his personality to, to the, you know, it's always fun to watch Cuba Gooding Jr. in, in, in a movie, uh, usually, anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I thought he, he, he did a good job. When his character was on the screen, you're like, oh, okay, here we go. Let's see what he's going to do now. Yeah. And he, he was a boxing champion. I mean, he, you know, they did portray that right. He was, yeah, Cuba Gooding Jr. was not, but Dory Miller was a boxing champion. I think champion. does have some training in the ring. I think he does, too. Yeah. I think he does, too. I don't think Forrest Whitaker was available. Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Dodge not. that bullet. <laughs> yeah. Oof, good thing. Well, the film focuses on three fictional characters. Rafe McCauley, Ben, who is played by Ben Affleck, Danny Walker, who's played by Josh Hartnett, and Evelyn Johnson, who is played by Kate Beckinsale. Is there any accuracy at all involved in their storylines or their actions? And not necessarily the love triangle that's together, but I mean, you know, these three people. Is there any accuracy at all to anything that these people show on screen? Larry, I see you making a face. Just don't even know. Um, let's see, I can tell you some of the things that are wrong, but... Go I mean, for it. So, uh, the Rafe fella, he... Uh, that's Ben Affleck, right? That is, that is okay. indeed. They're so forgettable. But he claims to uh, have received orders to go to England to fly for the RAF. Now, that is complete and utter... Like nonsense. It 
guys who were already pilots in the U.S. military, they would have went and flown with the AVG. So I guess the AVG timeline is uh, doesn't fit the needs of the story here because the AVG doesn't see combat until 12 days after Pearl Harbor. However, uh, a lot of fellows who couldn't get into the Army Air Corps uh, because of the two-year college requirement jumped the border and joined the Royal Canadian Air Force. And it was a way for guys who didn't have college to become fighter pilots. So uh, to my knowledge, there's no active uh, U.S. military fighter pilots flying for England. That is 100% accurate, Larry. You uh, you are 100% accurate, oh. not the movie. No, there, there are absolutely no records of any active American servicemen flying for the RAF in 1940, which is what this is, 40 or maybe early 41. Um, just like you said, the Eagle Squadron was, there, there were Americans in there, obviously, for sure, several. Mm-hmm. And not a huge number, but there were several, and they were all civilians, just like you said. Yeah. Um, one of the guys you talk about mentioning flying for the RCAF was uh, future Medal of Honor recipient John Morgan, Red Morgan. He was one of those guys who didn't have the education or the physical requirements to fly for the United States Army Air Forces. Mm-hmm. So he jumped the border and flew for Canada and then was pulled back in, in the Army Air Forces in 43. But, uh, you know, no, I mean, there's nothing accurate about what Ben does there in the, in the Eagle Squadron. What about you, Josh? Did you see anything at all? <laughs> I mean, you know. Where do you pick? I mean, I, th- I think the good, the symbol of of just ridiculousness of their storyline is is the whole like recruiting depot scene. Although they've been in it a little while, and I, you know, oh, yeah. I just get the uh, the letters confused sometimes. Like, it's not like a scooter that you're riding or a bicycle. It's an aircraft. You know, you have to go through training. You have to read letters that are assembled into things called manuals, and then you have to apply those lessons. You can't. Someone like that would have never made it anywhere, let alone, you know, let alone the college requirements for this type of stuff, you know. And uh, I mean, that could bring me to that other guy with the stutter, you know. Let like, it rip, man. You know, Captain Stutter is not going to be able to pilot an aircraft, even if he's competent. You know, Harvard candidate. If you can't simply communicate across a radio that s- someone needs to do something. You're not going to make it into a flying program anyway. And, and beyond that, that character, I, I don't know if that character would fly today, pardon the pun. I, I mean, it, it, it's pretty <laughs> offensive, actually. Oh. I, I think, uh, I think, and I think he, that red character stands as just an example of just bad judgment that was made over and over again throughout the movie on the part of the filmmakers. They just, they just made weird calls. Cuba Gooding Jr. screaming while he's shooting the gun. I mean, mm-hmm. just the dialogue, it's just this tinier dialogue at every turn. They, they just, I don't know what they were doing. It's yeah. very comic book. The, mm-hmm. the, the dialogue in the film is very, it's very, you know, 1942 those, Captain America. Those are some smooth aces. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that that movie is just, it's it's all tacky one-liners mm-hmm. that are just you like, know, it's like World War II stereotypes hit propaganda posters. Mm-hmm. They're both in two trucks and just collided. <laughs> And and after the fire and the collision and the jaws of life, they found some stuff sitting there. And they were like, man, this would be a great script for a movie. <laughs> and that's what they did. I'm convinced. I mean, the thing I'm most upset about besides losing three hours and three minutes of my life is the four ninety nine I had to pay <laughs> to watch this thing. That was a tough pill to swallow as well. <laughs> well, I see I rented it on standard definition, so I got off for two ninety nine. I found so. it streaming for free. It's free online. Oh, you did? Yeah. What? You gotta watch some commercials, but yeah, it's streaming oh, online. Oh, I yeah. done that. <laughs> <laughs> but you lost more of your life. Due to the commercials than I did. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. I mean, you didn't the commercials pop. were the best part, though. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't pop for the extra two bucks of the director's cut. You didn't. You didn't do that. I think that's an extra minute of. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's, I basically needed a, a barf bucket and a beer to get through this one. <laughs> Tell me what happens. I'm gonna get a refill. Oh man. <laughs> the first half an hour of this film is mostly a romance movie. But there are moments where it hints at the American views on World War II prior to the attack on Pearl Harbor, and it does. Does it properly capture that moment in time? Larry, what do you think? I guess it kind of looks like a Norman Rockwell calendar, all these scenes they're trying to shoot. Mm -hmm. You know, like everything is... I mean, I would hate to see, like, this script in person. It's got to be... 800 pages long I mean with all the you know the cuts they do in it it's like uh, I mean a Michael Bay film is like watching a strobe light to me it literally gives me a headache but um, I mean 
they tried to make it look pretty. I'll give them that. It looked like a pharmaceutical commercial it, in some, you know, like a uh, lot of slow motion. Does. Yeah, yeah. 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 a lot the, of slow motion. The, the golden hues. Yeah. The, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Like that Norman Rockwell look. Or, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I, I could see what they were getting at. They're trying to make it look glitzy, glamorous. Um, I, I guess that's what they were. There's no doubt for. they put money into this. Yeah, movie. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, there. I mean, I hate to, I hate to, to give it any kind of props, but there are instances in the movie, especially before the attack on Pearl, where the characters are going back and forth, and you know, there were the American civilians who wanted no part of the war. There were in Europe now, obviously, there were American civilians who did want to go to war. And who did want to fight? I mean, that's why you had the volunteers across the border and wanted to, wanted to go fight. So that is, it's not accurate, but it's a fairly decent, halfway decent representation of some of the opinion, I think, of some of the opinions of the American populace before World War II. Yeah, Pearl Harbor. I agree with that. I mean, it's, it's kind of the standard movie history lesson. You know, they have to add the, like, little context facts. I didn't so they even know the Japanese were so at us. No. Yeah, you know, and, and it's like, it's, once again, it gets, you know, that baseball bat of tacky lines beats crap out of this poor thing, but, but it does communicate those things in the tacky movie history lesson way, but it's all, like, little quick one-liners, and you're just kind of so annoyed you're watching it anyway, I kind of miss them a little bit. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's right. Didn't even know they were mad at us. Yeah, yeah. We'll get to that again in a minute. Um, you know, we were had a, we had a conversation uh, a bit before, and we were talking about this convoluted love triangle that is at the really. I'll be perfectly honest, which probably at the center of this whole damn thing, uh, unfortunately. And it's you know, it's to me, it reminds me of like you said, Josh, a very propaganda, very uh, Norman Rockwell, Larry kind of a view on the whole greatest generation thing that we've talked about here on the show, you know, ad nauseum is that, you know, you meet for what, two, three months or whatever, and you plan to get married and live happily ever after and that whole thing. And that's just, that's portrayed in this movie. And it's, as we all know here, grossly, grossly, grossly inaccurate, like the rest of the film. But it's, it's this very uh, Hollywood stylized version of wartime romances, which Frankly, the the romance between one of the pilots and the blonde, and I cannot remember her name, with the Brooklyn accent, is probably the most accurate <laughs> wartime romance. Certainly, far more so than uh, old Ben and Kate here in this yeah. one. Everyone wrote flowing, beautiful letters to each other and and folded little, origami for six yeah, hours. Yeah, little little sweet gestures and things like that. Or they met really, really quickly and got married very, very quickly. <laughs> and then came home and didn't know who the people were that they mm -hmm. married. Yeah, I think the important thing, whenever you're you're making a movie about an, an important event like this, you're trying to make a history movie, even if it's meant for mass consumption, mass audiences, and, you know, hopefully a blockbuster, you really want to, in order to honor, you know, the sacrifice, you want it to have some authenticity to it. And this movie just speaks of artificiality at every turn, particularly. Yeah. And you said the first thirty minutes are a romance. For me, I, I swear the first hour and a half. You're, um, you're probably I agree was, with that. There was yeah. a little bit of the Battle of Britain in there with Ben Affleck flying over Britain, but uh, yeah. um, it was really the first half of the movie. Uh, I mean, I just almost got a headache from rolling my eyes so much <laughs> uh, because it just it is just rings false at every turn. Yeah, it's not, it's not just that they they kind of missed on the history; it's they detract from it, make it even worse. Mm -hmm. Bye. Yeah, a lot of times when I'm watching a movie, particularly one that I don't like, I, I try to I play this little game where I, I say, how can you improve this movie? What is this movie sal salvageable? And I think you can, you might not be able to make it a good movie, but you can make it a not as bad movie with one cut. And that's just taking a pair of scissors and cutting it at about the 125 mark, right when the Pearl Harbor attack begins and throwing out that first hour and 25 minutes. Hmm. If you watch that, you're going to get the Pearl Harbor attack, which I think is a highlight of the movie. It's a case of damning it with faint praise, I know, but it's, <laughs> it is a highlight of the movie. And uh, and then you get the Doolittle Raids, which I thought was an interesting uh, idea to include that in, in a movie about Pearl Harbor. Um, and so I think that last hour and a half almost is uh, is interesting. Um, I, it's certainly better than the first hour and a half. I think it could have been rescued with one cut if you took the camera right before they were <laughs> filming and you took the power cord <laughs> and you cut it right there. That would have made it better. Cut, wrap. Yeah. <laughs> but Mike, I guess, like you were talking about the Doolittle Raid, I think that is the favorite 
Well, my favorite segment of the movie mm-hmm. is, is is the Doolittle raid. Are, is there another movie? Pray that, tell why. I mean, it's just. I don't know. I like. Uh, I like some of the special effects scenes. Mm-hmm. I guess. Is there mm-hmm. another movie that that handles the Doolittle raid? Oh yeah, yes, 30, it's seconds. Like thirty seconds over, over Tokyo. Tokyo. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And it's fantastic. I haven't, I haven't seen. I haven't seen it depicted. Of course, I know about it, but I hadn't really. I, I can't remember having seen it depicted um, until now. So or, 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 until. Pearl Harbor, so. Yeah, it's, I mean, the dual raid is, is, it was a huge morale mm-hmm. builder. And the movie did make that clear. But this did. isn't even a pinprick, but, you know, but it it's did. important. It did, but, I mean, it was, I, I'll be honest with you, I think the Doolittle raid portion from, from the time our two, quote, heroes, unquote, leave Hawaii until the end of the movie is the most inaccurate part of the entire film. Hmm. It's horrible. And we'll get to that also <laughs> later. It's way off. If I don't, we have the time. I don't get why it's on there. Well, I, th- I, I understand why it's there. I think it's there because, and we talked about, again, I'm going to go back yeah, to Tora Tora Tora. We're slapping them back. Go back to Tora Tora Tora. That, that was not a box office success. And one of the reasons we decided that it wasn't a box office success is because nobody wants to see a movie where we lose. You know, nobody. So what they took, they did, you know, Pearl Harbor's about a tragedy and, and they include that. But then they end on an up note where, you know, that we got we got some hope. And so I think that might be the reasoning when they, when they were writing the screenplay, why they wanted to extend it out there. And I'll be honest with you, though, when the, the, the Pearl Harbor attack was over and it's at, at like the two hour mark, I'm like, where are they going to go from here? What 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 is going to fill this last hour? Well, they have to blow up the asteroid. That's what that <laughs> right. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Oh, man. Well, while we're discussing the love triangle, which we're not any longer, but let's just talk about it, because I know this is probably, I'm going to assume, Mike, this is one of your talking points. This movie came out a few years after Titanic. Mm. And do you think that Titanic influenced the way that historical events are told within the framework of a blockbuster? I, I really do. I think you can't, any movie is a, a, a product of its time, and I think Pearl Harbor definitely is in that. It, w- it came out four years after Pearl Harbor. I mean, at four years after Titanic. And, you know, it, it takes a long time for a movie like this to get made. So I guarantee you this sucker went into production right after Titanic set new records, new box office records, became the highest grossing film of all time at that point. And I can see Bruckheimer, who, you know, is, is a, a blockbuster, churns out blockbusters like the Pirates of the Caribbean movies, Michael Bay, who the Transformers movies, and like I said, he's the, the poster boy for brainless blockbusters. They looked at Titanic and said, oh, we can do that. And so they took a tragic historical event, they wrote a, a, a romance around it, and they poured a whole lot of money into it and decided, hey, let's see if, uh, if audiences like that one, they'll like this one. And I think what we learn is that, and, and actually, it, it, they even put a, a ton of money into the premiere. The premiere was the, the most expensive movie premiere of all time to that point. It was held aboard the USS John C. Stennis at Pearl Harbor. Floating it, they erected a movie screen on the deck and flew journalists in and, and veterans and special guests to to watch. Which, t- t- gosh, to me, that, talk that, about that a waste seems of money. Ab- well, it seems obscene. I mean, that's 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 hallowed that's hallowed ground, or that's this is a special place. And that this this movie, this movie that which cheapens it in, in in a lot of ways. But but what it shows you is that you you a, a lot of money can buy a pretty movie, but it can't make a good movie necessarily. Well, it's kind of like a. It's it's a boy band of of movies. Mm, that's you know, it, yeah, that's, it's glitz, it's glam. Everything's run through a computer. But if you want to boil it down to something, a couple of dudes with not a whole ton of musical talent on stage dancing around. <laughs> no, and there a lot of the shots in there I thought were very Titanic esque mm-hmm. too. You see Kate Beckinsale sitting on a rock, and she's you know perfectly you know postured, and her legs are crossed just so, and she looks like a pinup girl. Yeah, and she really looked like somebody took a painting of a Varga girl and went, okay, make her pose like this. And then they shot the camera, you know, with the sun setting behind her and the wind blowing through her hair. It was disgusting. They took the Titanic formula uh, to such an extreme. They even had a special song written for it, uh, which was actually nominated for an Academy Award. One of those Oscar nominations was for the song. I can't remember who it was, but it wasn't Celine Dion. But and I read that was their first choice was Celine, Celine Dion. Mm. Yeah, to do that song. Oh, there it goes. I mean, I that, think they uh, were going full repeater. For me, what sealed it is at the very end when they zoom into the sunken 
you know, crusty up what I assume is supposed hey, to be the Arizona. True. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. like, that's kind of where it just, you know, you always hear, oh, here's Titanic-esque or whatever. And when they finally, that wasn't even necessary, and they stick it in there, you're like, this is exactly like Titanic. Yeah, to take your two trucks colliding uh, metaphor, I think Titanic and Tor Tor Tora, if they collided, mm-hmm. that, that's what you'd get with this movie. Oh, man, you just insulted Tor Tor Tora. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'll remind you, I wasn't really fond of that movie. <laughs> Tor Tor Tora was a well-built truck, and it probably did crush through, you know, Pearl Harbor. Titanic, but well, I guess the logic behind that's pretty sound. Let's take yeah. these two things and uh, like soften each one, I guess. Well, that's what Hollywood but, uh, does, it repeats things, you yeah. Know. yeah, yeah. Well, many films get the historical events wrong, and I think it's fair to say that we all know that this one gets those historical events wrong. Do you think this, inf- and this is important, do you think that this influences public knowledge slash memory? of these events and if so do you feel like that is dangerous yes i think it does and in in fact i know it does my wife happens to be a public school teacher she teaches ap us history and when she gets to world war ii she says every year kids know about pearl harbor and they know about the doolittle raid because of this movie uh she said in the past in the past few years not as many um but up until that point everybody knew and, and and they liked the movie you know, they, they were fans of the movie, which also does kind of talk about, I mean, it spe- say something to the fact that this movie does feel childish in a way. It feels very juvenile. A comic book. Yeah. It feels like a comic yeah. book. So, and so those kids' knowledge of those events were informed by that. Um, my wife happens to be a very good school teacher and was able to set them straight. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, so, so it, 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 that definitely does inform the, the public perception and... Yeah, it can be dangerous. It can be a bad thing. I, I agree with you 200% because we, I have had conversations with people numerous times about how the United States was the reason that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor because we cut off their oil. Mm-hmm. Now, whether they got that harebrained scheme from this movie or not, I have no idea. But that is not, repeat, not why the Japanese Navy attacked the United States Pacific Fleet and, and the Army Air Force's Army Air Corps and Pearl Harbor on the 7th of December, 1941. They were an imperialistic nation and they were setting out to conquer the Pacific area. We were their biggest threat and they wanted to get us knocked out of the way real fast so they could go about and do their thing, which they did for six months. But, but I mean, it was to take oil. The Japanese were targeting java to take the oil fields because we cut off our supply to them the japanese I, I the japanese did not attack pearl harbor because we cut off their oil they attacked us to get us out of the way so they could have a free hand That's to what take I just java said. yeah but and we cut off our oil exports to them yeah i know that I mean, I'm, not, I'm not saying we didn't cut off their oil i'm not yeah. saying that we did not put an oil embargo on japan because we certainly did yeah, But that is not the reason that Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. As I said, and you just said, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor to get us out of the way mm-hmm. so they could have a free hand. But I mean, their we, al- their they ultimate did depend goal. on us for about 80% of their, their petroleum Sure needs. they did. Sure they did. And that was, that was the reason why they needed to get their own and take Java in the, in the uh, Java Pacific. Java and the Philippines and Wake mm-hmm. and Guam and Australia. Yeah, but that, that was their primary goal was to take Java, take yeah, those oil fields. Natural resource. I, th- I think the whole point of it is that, and it's kind of the spirit of this podcast and what it kind of addresses is, is movies are a mix of history and Hollywood. And how does that balance influence what pops out on the other end? So be it history, if it's a very historically accurate, it certainly does carry that mission. It's always going to have a little wavering I think I agree that movies, especially like this one, are very dangerous, A, because they miss the mark. They do drop some history in there. It's influenced, in, you know, the whole movie history where they make their little comments and, you know, kind of shows the big cardinal direction. But when it's targeted towards impressionable audiences, especially like youth for this movie, for instance, it plants that seed of misinformation or not the total story because you can't give a history lecture in a movie and have a bunch of kids come watch it. But they're the ones that bring that stuff to the classroom and keep it going until they bother to figure out or are told what's different about it. So. Is there, is, is, do you think, and I'm, I guess I'm playing devil's advocate here, um, a, as an entry level movie, if somebody knows nothing about Pearl Harbor, somebody maybe not even have an interest in World War II, and they watch this movie, which is uh, cinematic cotton candy, right? Mm-hmm. 
um, maybe sparks an interest, maybe has them decide to go dig deeper and maybe do a little bit more investigation on well, their own. I encounter that entry, a lot. As an entry-level World War II movie, you know? Well, I mean, you know, video games is, is mm-hmm. the big one that, that I encounter with, you know, Call impressionable children. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I love this video game, so I want to know more about this stuff. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I guess in that regard, it's good, you know, that you could watch a dumpster fire like this and get inspired <laughs> to learn what actually happened, you know? I mean, I guess that's good, but... I imagine probably more people don't dig further and that, and that's, than do, that's, I guess. And that's what I was about to say, is that people, especially today, and I mean, I have two children, one of them's seven and the other one's ten, but my ten-year-old watches a lot of this kind of stuff. And, I mean... I have to consistently say, mm, that's that's not how that happened. Let, yeah. me, let me tell you. You want to know? I'll tell you. And it's, it's, it is dangerous because, unfortunately, in today's world, I'm not saying all kids by any means, but a lot of kids are going to see what they see on the screen, and they're going to take that as gospel truth because it's on the screen. Mm-hmm. They're not going to go and pick up a book. Their mom and dad probably aren't going to bring them to the library. Maybe they will. Good on you if you do. But... I just I, I find it very hard to believe that more people are going to kids, young kids are going to look at this and go, "Ooh, I want to learn more. Maybe they do. I'm not saying that they don't. I'm sure there are. But I think if you're going to make a movie under the guise of it being a historical movie, under the guise of it being a, you know, set in a historical. And that is setting, how they sold this movie. They, this was a historical drama. They, that's why they brought those yeah. cats to Pearl Harbor to show the dang thing mm-hmm. in the first place. That's why they called it Pearl Harbor. They could have totally <laughs> called it something different. And, you know, we might even be having a different conversation because, you know, it's it's targeted to say, like, advertise straight what? up Pearl Harbor. Didn't it have another movie title, a working title? I don't know. I'm not Pearl sure how it worked for him. No, I, <laughs> seriously. In all, in all seriousness, I think it I did. Know. I think I, I want to say the working title of the movie was Tennessee. Oh, really? I swear to God. And it's not named after the battleship either, but named after the state. Huh. I think because oh, that's where those two yeah, idiots they are from. from. They're from the it's state also, of Tennessee. That's also where the screenwriter was from. The screenwriter oh, I was did not know that. Randall Wallace, who wrote the, the he wrote Braveheart. He wrote Braveheart. He? Yeah. he got an Academy Award nomination, which came Another out historic. Came out in nineteen ninety five. So again, this, this goes back to what what uh, Bruckheimer and Bay were trying to do, trying to recreate Titanic. They went and got. Uh, a guy who won an award for writing a historical romance uh, that, that of some acclaim, and as they were trying to recreate Titanic, yeah. But, he, I, but he's from Tennessee, so that that could also. I, be. I swear, I mean, I could be dead wrong here, and I'm sure somebody will be more than only too happy to point that out in our comments. But <laughs> I'm fairly certain the working title of this film was Tennessee. They should have kept it as that. I think and a, it would have been a little more a easy to swallow. Targeted historic title would have. Yeah, I maybe think, altered your view of it. You know, if you make a movie and you entitle it Gettysburg and you talk about the battle for New Orleans, well, then you're you're screwing the pooch. You're missing the point here. And this is what this film does, in my opinion. But let's move on. Uh, there the, goes that vein. Yeah, it's, it's, starting vein pulse. <laughs> it's starting to pulse. Not going to lie. The film focuses on three main historical events. And we've kind of talked about this, but we're going to talk about it again because we're going to talk about the last one. The Blitz, the attack on Pearl Harbor and the Doolittle Raid. What are your thoughts on how these are depicted? What do you think about the Blitz, Larry? I know you've done some stuff on the Blitz before, um, the Battle of Britain. I mean, they had the White Cliffs of Dover in there, and they had German fighters, uh, German bombers, uh, Spitfires. I guess they did that pretty good. I, um, I, I have to but say. that's about it. I mean, it, th- there's only very few scenes of that, yeah. just really quick. But I think the scenes of the dogfights, I, I mean, visually— I think that's pretty slick. I mm-hmm. have to say, I think I think it looks cool. Not the P forty stuff, but the the spit the Battle of Britain stuff. Mm-hmm. I think visually it looks pretty good. Um, I mean, they didn't totally miss on gear, equipment, and yeah, that stuff looked and aircraft pretty and, good. Mm-hmm. That was a nice little setup in front of the manor. You know, mm-hmm. very British and Battle of Britain. I think everything except John Voight's chin looked good. This, <laughs> this is a handsome movie. If, if if nothing else, it is a movie that looks good. It that is may pretty. be one they forgot to buy and had to run out to a costume store. You know, day of filming, like oh crap, we're gonna go to Halloween store yeah. and get him a chin. <laughs> right, <laughs> that's what it looks like. But you could see. I don't know if you guys noticed all this product placement. I noticed. Um, like I bet Ray-Ban thought they were going to sell a bunch of sunglasses after this movie Hamilton watches are I saw in the there. Hamilton watch yeah. um, Eastman A2 leather jackets Eastman A2 leather jackets yeah yeah but anyway that was 
I guess I just really geeked out just now. But <laughs> no, not at all. I mean, the, the gear in the movie is is I think. For, I mean, there are some things that are not right. Like mm-hmm. they had the diff- they had the wrong Spitfires, I think, in there. If I remember yeah. correctly, yeah, yeah, those they were certain, five Bs, I think. It's hard there. to get moving aircraft like that, you know, to pick them apart. Like in, in the Doolittle Raid sequence, you know, the B-25s aren't the right B-25s, no. but they are B-25s. Yeah, They're they, real ones. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, they made an effort. There's no doubt about it, you know, but they did not make an effort with those modern class naval vessels. And that's they where blow I was going up. Pearl oh, Harbor. I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Roll with it, man. Roll with it. Pearl uh, Harbor. How do yeah, you... those stick out like a sore thumb, man. And and why spend all this money to make a uh, full-size gimbal of Oklahoma capsizing and then go and put these vessels in that are, that just they just don't work you know i think even do you think it's just us that see this though? I, I didn't see it i'll be honest with you that, okay. didn't, that didn't jump out to me but i'm a moron when it comes to that Boy, kind of stuff well, nerd alert for us huh <laughs> well there, there's sequences too like when they when they show the japanese fleet when they show kido butai moving they, they, they show the cg of the japanese carriers and they look pretty good mm-hmm. and then they show yeah, the same show a Nimitz friggin' class carriers, and it's like you know a carrier you'll see in San Diego right now. Mm-hmm. You know, right. It, it's well, there are formation bizarre. formation issues with it too. It looks like you took a picture of an American task force moving in the Persian Gulf. You know, like everyone's like nice and blocked together. It's just kind of it's a strange look for it, and and maybe it is us nerding out about the ships. And and there's definitely a, a misconception about U.S. Navy ships are always painted gray. You know, most museum ships that people have gone to as they were growing up and everything. So I don't think it sticks out as much to most people. But if you know even half a thing, you know that it's just absurd, all the stuff they're blowing up. Half it doesn't even make sense. Well, and that's that's another thing that I wanted to say. There are more explosions in the attack on Pearl Harbor in this movie than there probably were if the Japanese would have attacked Pearl Harbor five times. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it's just one after the other, after the other, after the other. And it's just... It's, it's the Michael Bay effect. Yeah. That's also but gravy. That's, that's what you come for, right? That's the that's the payoff of the whole movie. So they had to make that big. And so yeah, it, is, it is big. Well, they dropped you know, like 65 bombs on the yard in front of the hospital. Like, what? Which, by the way, just so everybody knows, the Japanese did not attack the Naval Hospital in Pearl Harbor. Is that true? Because when that happened, I was like, oh my gosh, look at that. Yeah, I mean, in the movie, they light it up. Yeah, they do. But in, acu- in, in, in accuracy, in actuality, there was one naval hospital um, attendant that was killed during the attack. And I frankly don't remember how she was killed. I, I don't know if it was there or if it just ha- she happened to be out there. I and think she, she was on her way in. I don't recall. Something that I read. I but think they she's never on did her attack way. The per- they never the, did attack Pearl Harbor. The, the attack hospital. even begins out of sequence. I mean, it's not torpedoes that hit first. It's a, a Val, a Japanese dive bomber bombing the ramp at Fort Island, I believe. That's the, f- that's the first detonation. But then that's... That's really nerding out over here. No, it's well, um, no, it's not because we're here to talk about the accuracy, and that is not an accurate portrayal. I mean, they have the, the second wave, which in the movie there is no break between the first and second wave, which in reality there was. The second wave's got torpedo planes coming in it too, and it's just it seems like the yeah, Japanese, there's no torpedo planes in the second. Not at all. It's yeah. very all. um, it's very flying circus, or no, no aircraft armed with torpedoes, I should say. Yeah. It's, yeah, because they were they were level bombers. Mm-hmm. The Gates came in. Yeah. yeah, it's it's very flying circus. There's a lot of loitering time for a bunch of these aircraft, sort of zooming around. Like certainly there's strafers. It's the fighters came in escort. They had nothing to fight except for our two heroes who somehow smoked all of them. Um, but you know, I'd, I know it's kind of like watching the Tora 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 demonstration at an air show. There's a lot of the feeling yeah. I got of watching that, and that's probably because it was those cats. And I don't know if this is accurate but i did read a stat on this film that i think it cost about 150 million dollars to make this film which money well spent yeah <laughs> but but not not adjusted for inflation 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 <laughs> yeah there's a new concept we've invented inflation um but they say that this movie cost in real dollars more than the damage the japanese inflicted wow. on pearl harbor good lord yeah i wouldn't doubt it isn't that something, though? I wouldn't I doubt it. I would have rather the, rebuilt Pearl Harbor. For all the five-gallon gas cans they laid up across the top of those cruisers that were nestled together and then lit them on fire, make those big fiery explosions <laughs> during the attack. You Poof. know, it's, it's kind of funny. When I was um, when I was younger, it was 2000, our dad took us out to, to, Tex, to Houston, 
and we saw the exit for the battleship Texas. And, you know, he was like, oh, let's go there. And so we, we went down. If you go there, you got to ride this little rinky-dink ferry across the uh, channel and everything, and you pull up to San Jacinto, and you see the Texas. I was so excited. And there were little white sailors all over, guys dressed in white, all over the ship, and we couldn't get in. And they're like, oh, well, they're filming for a movie called Pearl Harbor here. No kidding. Yeah. And I was, I was, at that moment, I was super excited. Yeah, really, think, really excited to see that movie. I was like, oh, I can't wait till this thing comes out. I think there was the Doolittle Raid scenes because I, I, I'd read that they, they have one of the interesting things. This movie is being a modern movie. Today's movies productions always print out. Um, they, they write up production notes, about five thousand word essays, where the director describes his vision. And so it, it is useful to kind of go back and look at that. Older movies don't have that, but I went back and looked at the production notes for this one, and they talked about how the Doolittle Raid scenes were shot in the Gulf of Mexico around Galveston and that area. So that must have been. It must have been the well, that was probably that's Lady Lex down in Corpus. Mm. So I think they were they were filming they that rollover rig for the Oklahoma. I think they were filming on the Texas because you can see some interchanges when there's just people cruising around. You see the two twin fourteen mm. on the Texas, and I just I remember being so excited about it, A movie. and I was just super disappointed later <laughs> when it came out. In those same production notes, Michael Bay. I, think, I don't I don't remember if it's Michael Bay or Bruckheimer. Uh, says something along the lines of, you know, this isn't a documentary. Boy, that ain't a lie. Yeah, but, you know, if you got to say it, it's basically him going, we get a lot of stuff wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's how I interpreted it. Well, I think one of the big things with the attack, since we were talking about that, is um, bombs aren't made out of gasoline. Mm. When a bomb lands, it's not a big, cool fireball with the, the destroyers we keep talking about, yeah, those things explode into flames. It's it's not necessarily how a high explosive works. Yeah, but that's that you can't just blame Michael Bay for that. That's I think all people, all Americans believe that because Hollywood has been doing it that way for so long. In fact, when they make those explosions, they do use gasoline ex precisely because it creates that big orange fireball that's mm -hmm. so pretty on the screen. So that that's a Hollywood convention that's Hollywood's been doing wrong since long before Michael Bay came along. Game Idea does it really bad here, so let's just keep piling on. <laughs> um, <laughs> the Doolittle Raid, and, and this is something that I, I, that I find to be, honest to God, the, the, the most inaccurate part of this whole movie. You know, and, and for many reasons, and I really don't feel like getting into every single reason because we'll run out of time, but not the least of which is they recruit these two clowns and actually their whole squadron to go back overseas or back, well, back to the Continental 48 and they are recruited and are volunteer to fly in what will eventually be the first raid on Tokyo. These are fighter pilots. They could not, I mean, yeah, they could probably fly B-25, but there were no B-25 pilots. There were no fighter pilots who were flying B-25s in the little raid. This was, they came from two bombing units, actual B-25 bombing units that were selected by Jamie Doolittle to participate in this action because they had the most flying hours. Had nothing to do with them being the two only the, only the two Air Army Air Forces pilots with combat experience. That's a load of baloney. This is April 1942. There was plenty of guys with combat experience by April in 1942. And I mean, the whole, you know, the thing that they, they, they put it on the carrier Hornet, that's accurate, even though the Hornet that they show in the movie is not the Hornet. Well, it's not the World War II Hornet. And that, that is accurate. I mean, obviously, you know, the, the Raiders did launch from the Hornet, and they did attack Tokyo and other places, too. They did have to, to leave the carrier earlier when they were spotted. Yes. They did. No. Yeah. They did. They did. But, I mean, again, there's just so many little... I tell you something that is accurate in stuff. that little uh, scene. Did did you see the, how the gas cans were shaped, how they look like olive oil cans? Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. Because yeah. mm -hmm. we, get, we get the traditional gas can shape that we picture. We copy that from the Germans. They call it the a jerry can. Yeah, that's why it's, yeah, it's called can. a jerry can. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the little silver mm -hmm. colored little... The flimsies, the British used to call them. Mm -hmm. if, you watch, if you watch 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, they use those in there as well. But, I mean, you know, there are some, some things... And, and the whole movie has a little bit of here, a little bit of there, a little bit of here that, that, that is somewhat historically accurate. You know, there was an attack on Pearl Harbor. The Japanese <laughs> did it. There was an attack on Tokyo... Americans did it, you know, and they did fly B-25s and they did launch from the carrier Hornet. And there were two pilots who got up and like scored six victories that day. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Kenneth Welsh and uh, uh, Kenneth Taylor and George Welsh absolutely did. And, and that is one of the cooler actions of the Pearl Harbor story, frankly, because they're one of the few guys. How many? I think there were, what, 12 guys? Something got 12 like that. 12 or 14. It's, I think Gabby Gabreski is another one who got up that day. 
there were there were the two, but the two most famous guys. Oh yeah, and, and I think by that's, far, by far, that's who our uh, our dudes here are based off. That's who they're supposed, supposed to be. be. Yeah, I think they're officially credited with six victories, but not to be outdone, Rafe and Danny get seven. Nice. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's that's one of the things that kills me about this movie is is you know Taylor and Welsh. Their story is actually pretty Hollywood, and if you, you actually think about it, guys are at a. You don't have to change it. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. It's a party the night before. Yeah, it's you know kind of a famous line that I've heard before. Where it's the drama. Like, well, these guys have the drama. They they're at an all night party. You know, they're maybe playing poker, contemplating going back. They hear about the attack. There's a zooming back in their car. The real story is awesome. They do it well in Tora 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 too. Mm-hmm. They do. You know, they do. No, I mean the guys. I mean, in reality, they were they were at a Christmas party the night before, and then they got into an all night poker game. And I'm just going to go out on a limb and assume that two young Army fighter pilots had been drinking at this party, especially after they were playing poker. So the whole thing where, you know, the, the two clowns are, you know, passed out drunk in the back of the Buick, that that's not accurate. But, yeah, they'd been drinking and they'd been consuming alcohol more than likely. And, I mean, the story, like you were saying, Josh and Larry, both of you all, the story of Walsh and Taylor is, is – or Welsh and Taylor, rather – is incredibly cool because they did do that. You know, they they get on the phone and and call and say, hey, you know, load it up, fuel it up, we're coming to get it. They were based at Wheeler Field and they went to Haleiwa because that was one of the few fields that had not been attacked yet. If I'm if if I'm accurate on that, yeah, I think, I, I, I think so. And they take off from Haleiwa and and they go and they do tear up some Japanese aircraft. They tear up um, Vals, I think, are the ones. Vals, that they and lay I into. think they got one uh, Zeke. They, they, they do one. tangle, but that's the second time because they, they actually do yeah, it twice. They rearm at Wheeler, I believe. Mm-hmm. But, you know, when they rearm at Wheeler, they don't have 50 caliber ammunition. So there's two 50s in the nose of that aircraft. And, and 30s in the wings. And 30s in the wings. So they do most of their damage with just 30 caliber machine guns. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's accurate shooting by, you know, by any uh, standards, but and the real story is cool. And if they would have just followed that story for this film and leave out the stupid love triangle and just follow these two dudes, if you wanted to do a story about two badass fighter pilots who you know, got up in the air on Pearl Harbor during the seventh of December, you follow the real story of these two cats, and it, it's it's very 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 interesting. Yeah, that would have been cool just if they had just done that. Yeah, and, absolutely. And maybe w- there were some nurses, you know, who knows? But. <laughs> I think it would have been better than what they've they they invented, but you the, know. I do like the tiki bar that they're at, though. Yeah, that place looks like a good place to party. I like any tiki bar. Amen to that. <laughs> the uh, the nurses, the real ones, probably wore their uniforms at one point as well. <laughs> unlike this movie, where they're always yeah, in bathrobes and, yeah. and very finely dressed wherever they go. Yeah. Oh man! Well, when we did the Tora 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 episode, Mike, mm-hmm. we talked about uh, a lot of the deficiencies of that film, including no big name stars, no personal stories to forge a connection with the audience. Pearl Harbor, this film, often feels like it specifically set out to correct some of those issues. Do you think it does it successfully? Yeah, you know, just like I said, it, this, this feels like Titanic collided with Tor 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 because it, it almost feels like they watched that film and saw what it did wrong, what Tor 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 did wrong, and said, "Let's fix that." So they get John Voight to play FDR. You get Alec Baldwin as Jimmy Doolittle. You got Dan Aykroyd and of course Ben Affleck. I think Josh Hartnett and um, Kate Beckinsale would have. They were not really known at the time, but you got these big names to put on the posters, which is one of the reasons that Tor 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 they they put all their money into the into the. The hardware, right? And so, so that's one thing they did. They get butts in the seats to try to turn a profit. And then the personal stories, and I know there's deep inaccuracies, but I liked the idea of the nurse's point of view. It's not something you'd seen before. I liked the idea of the Dory Miller story being worked in there. And so I thought they did add some personal elements in an effort to kind of invite you in so it's not as clinical as Tora 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 comes off as. Um, and, then, and then the... Uh, the, well, I mean, they do the they all they build up to the the big payoff sequence, which is the the, the Pearl Harbor attack, which I think they do well. But again, like I mentioned earlier, they don't end with that. They don't end with you know, oh, we've awakened a sleeping dragon. They go ahead and end it on a high note, end it with some hope, end it with the uh, the Doolittle raid. So those are those are things that I think they almost feel like reactions to Tora Tora Tora. And I mean, you can argue uh, you know whether or not it works or not, but it just seems to me that this and they I've never seen anywhere where Michael Bay or Jerry Bruckheimer say. They were influenced by it, but they had to have been. 
just just watching it and seeing. I mean, really, the structure of the movie is very, very similar to Tor Tor Tor, where you have a, a very long preamble and you have a, a, a very well staged attack that starts out about midway through. You also flash back and forth between the American point of view and the Japanese point of view. Uh, both movies do that. Uh, you get more of it for, and, and more credibly, of course, in Tor Tor Tor. But we do we do get a lot of that in uh, in Pearl Harbor. So I mean, it's, it really kind of follows a lot of the same beats. I think, I mean, you know, when you talk, when you, and you got to compare the two. Mm-hmm. You, you have to. You can't do anything like this and not. But, I mean, I think when you, you know, you talk about Tor Tor Tor, my personal favorite part of the whole film are the Japanese sequences because they're cool. You know, it's they're something really that, well made. Yeah. There's something that you don't see a lot in American movies. You see it in another steaming pile called Midway <laughs> and not the new one, but the old one. I haven't seen the new one yet. But, um you know there are the Japanese sequences in there, and in Midway they're horrible. But in in, in this movie, and uh, Tora Tora Tora, they're they're very well done. But in this movie too, I think they missed the boat, man. No pun intended. But um, kind of like Midway. What? Kind of like Midway. Oh, oh, I don't know man. what we're gonna do next time. <laughs> Goodness. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I, I just I, I think they missed the boat on a lot of this. I mean, Pearl Harbor, the actual story of the event, has got more dramatic points and cool stories than probably most events of World War II, in my opinion. And there is no shortage of material there. And I think they just, they, as I said before, screwed the pooch when they just in, tried to include, you know, this stupid love triangle and just really poor, to say the least, dialogue and really not very good acting on anybody's part either, with the exception of maybe Cuba Gooding Jr. Yeah. when he's not screaming. Yeah, I, I, I don't. This is not verifiable. I don't know if this is true, but I, I, I'd be willing to put money on uh, Ben Affleck's accent. I, I'm willing to bet he studied Elvis because he's so. I mean, he, he's miss, he's just missing a lip curl. And then when the attack happens, the Pearl Harbor attack knocks the accent right out of him for a few scenes. Did anybody notice that? <laughs> it's, it's very, it's it's very it's stressful. But, 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 but this is his southern accent. <laughs> that's, that's what he sounds like throughout the whole movie. It was driving me crazy. And but El- I think but Elvis was from Mississippi. I know. I know. That's the other thing. <laughs> But I think when you when you're comparing Tor 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 and Pearl Harbor, uh, it comes down to and, and I think both of them are flawed. Uh, it, but it comes down to the intentions of the movie. And I think Tor 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 really wanted to make an authentic experience. They wanted to explain this is how it happened. Pearl Harbor did not. Pearl Harbor wanted to entertain, uh, and it, it fell short in that regard as well. But I think th- those intentions really define th- the movies. If you, if you want to find one that is, is at least has noble intentions, Tor 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 would be the the superior oh, film. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, um, we're going to have to start wrapping this beast up, and it is a beast. So I'm going to go around the horn, and I'm going to start with you, Josh. Um, I already know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Did you like this movie, and would you recommend it? No. and uh, No. <laughs> with, a, with another no on top of that. Larry? Well, I understand what the movie's trying to do. It's trying to appeal to the 12-year-old girl inside of me, right? (laughs) Um, And I think it totally misses the mark on that, but I do have my go-to when I want to feel that way, though, and it's a war movie called Hanover Street with Harrison Ford, which does a much better job than... Of getting uh, into the 12-year-old girl. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. so uh, I think it's a pretty good film, but it's in the same vein of Pearl Harbor, but Pearl Harbor completely misses for me. Mike? Yeah, look, I think I'm just going to steal what is probably one of the best sentences ever written in the history of movie criticism from, of course, Roger Ebert, who wrote about this film. Pearl Harbor is a two-hour movie squeezed into three hours about how, on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese staged a surprise attack on an American love triangle. (laughs) (laughs) Sometimes when you're writing, I don't know if you guys do this, but we journalists, you you write a sentence that you know is just so brilliant, you got to get up and kind of walk it off a little bit. (laughs) I bet old Roger was walking that one off for days, because that's that's the the, the best description of this movie that I could... uh, I could imagine. Oh, man. So my answer to the question is absolutely not. I did not (laughs) like this movie at all. And, I mean, I hadn't seen this movie in a very, very long time. I remember going to see it. I hate to admit this. Going to see it at the theater because, like you, I was like, cool, movie about Pearl Harbor. (laughs) Walked out, wanted to barf. And I watched it again over the last two days. It took me that long to sit through it. And I was not drinking when I watched it. Yeah, Yeah, neither was I. It was hard, man. And, um... 
I'd, I'd rather have a root canal. It, it was one of the worst movies I've ever seen in my life. And not just a war movie, but just a movie, period. It is trash. Absolute garbage. But I think 13-year-olds might have loved it. Because I think somebody that's what, did. Was, somebody paid to get into the who, damn who, thing. Who it was suited for, one who of which it was, was me, made for. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I know Josh and a, a fellow curator of ours named James Lynn. I know this has got to be one of his favorite movies. Oh yeah. Because yeah, while we've been preparing to do this, Josh and I, he's been quoting these lines nonstop. Is he now? Stop. He yes, sure he has. has. Oh well, yes. that's good to know. That gives ammunition to me. <laughs> But he says he hates the film. He says he hates the film. I, I kind of don't believe him. I think he was a 12-year-old who watched this thing endlessly over oh, and I'm over sure. again. And he I th- probably owns I think the box that, set. I think that kind of speaks to it. Is like, we're talking about it now. This thing's a pile of steam and garbage. We'd never accept, you know, suggest it to anyone. But we are still talking about it because it did have that little run. I'm, I'm willing to bet it had... What, three rentings this week? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and one freebie, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Damn it. Yeah, James keeps saying, the heart of a volunteer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And driving us nuts. That He's a, doing it all week. That is the know? winner for the most painful yeah. speech in that. Well, why don't you bring him a Hawaiian shirt tomorrow and let him make him more than that? I almost brought office. one today. I totally <laughs> forgot it this morning. Yeah, that would have been awesome. That would have been awesome. I was disappointed well, just, in myself. Just real, real quick, aside from James Lynn, do you know anybody who likes this steaming pile of horse manure? Anybody? Well, I'll go back to my my wife's except for the twelve year old girls. Students, uh, they they my wife's students are fond of it. I think because it's you know it's geared toward toward that mentality. I, you know, I remember when when I first saw it. I don't think I saw it in theaters, but I do remember renting the video. I don't think I hated it. I remember going, oh, that's not a great movie, but whatever. Um, I, I didn't really pay it much mind. I wasn't reviewing films at the time. Um, and I, I knew it wasn't a good movie. And I, boy, I, it was lost on me exactly how execrable it, it is until I rewatched it. Were the your other children day. young at that time? Yes. That's yes. probably because you were sleep deprived, Mike. I had a three year old and a one year old yeah. at the time. <laughs> that's, why, that's why you don't remember it being a crap right. movie, is because you were sleep deprived. That, that's probably We've all right. been there. That's yeah. called car crash adrenaline. <laughs> Boom, bang. Wow, I can't believe that just happened i feel okay though you wake up the next morning sore <laughs> final thoughts mike wrap it up oh uh, I, I can't top that with josh just said <laughs> i'm gonna leave it with him <laughs> larry uh pick another film there you go that's a good one josh dumpster fire <laughs> every 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 meaning of the word dumpster fire with my propaganda posters and world war ii stereotypes <laughs> all just dumped in all right, well, I'll be the, uh, the my normal pithy self, and I'll say, as most of you know, I usually pull a quote from the film that I find to be encompassing of the theme or one that has special meaning to me. Uh, for this one, I couldn't find one from the movie, no surprise here. But I will use a quote from another film. That film is entitled Team America, World Police. Oh, geez. <laughs> and the quote goes like this, Pearl Harbor sucked, and I miss you. <laughs> So with that, I want to thank you so much for listening. If you'd like to hear more about the events we discussed today, the real events we discussed today, tune into our mini-episode next week. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Service on Celluloid. Be sure to rate and review us on Stitcher and iTunes if you like what you hear. I'd like to thank everyone who made this podcast possible, our producer, Tessa Jager, and our sound engineer, Jeremy Burson. This has been a production of the National World War II Museum. (laughs) ¶¶